Martin of Julia Bill. Hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, Mass Future. Today, I present Dr. Keith Steele, who is a researcher and developer and consultant on crowd science. Now, crowd science is an application or its own mathematical science that has to do with complexity and emergent behavior and other parts of dynamic systems and differential equations and several other areas of mathematics that Keith will talk about. So we will do um, an event where Keith will talk about his work and then we'll have questions. Now, you can type questions in the chat as you go just so um, they are there and I will collect them or you can wait until the en uh, end of the presentation about 20 minutes from now and uh, then ask your questions. You can ask them in um, voice or uh, in chat again. So, uh, Keith, it's all yours. Okay, well, uh, hello, and uh, sorry about the technical difficulties, but um, we're here now. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a background, um, I've been doing this for a number of years. My PhD is interdisciplinary maths and psychology, and that's a really odd combination, because normally mathematicians and psychologists don't agree on the same scientific principles or even the same criteria for establishing um, uh, statistical significance. Um, however, when you're dealing with crowds, you need to understand both the hard numbers, how many people can we get in and out of space safely and efficiently, and also the psychology, the behavior of the crowd. So uh, I won't read through the entire slide, but the reason I do this is probably best illustrated if we have a look at the last 25 years. Now that uh, page, which I'm sure you can see on the screen, gives you some idea of the mass fatalities around the world. And I've highlighted in red those that could have been identified in the design phase if just some basic modeling uh, techniques had been applied. Now, one of the reasons that this is uh, so apparent is that whenever you deal with major events and ask somebody about what kind of mathematics or uh, models are you applying, um, you usually hear their brains freeze up. And that's because people that are involved in the events are, are not mathematicians. Now, when we talk about the kind of mathematics that needs to be involved in this, like, as you can see in red, design throughput, I need to know how many people can go through a particular space over what period of time safely and efficiently. And there is only one number to apply to that. Um, but you do it in a first-pass approximation. So what we have here is a principle where I can take a site, I can do a first-pass approximation, and I can see whether or not it is fit for its intended purpose. It's not difficult. However, it's just not taught. And the reason is that most people will look at events and think that they are unique, that there is so fundamentally unique to my site that how could I possibly apply a model to it? I need to do it each and every time. But in fact, there are very simple principles that can be applied. And over the last 25 years, we've developed this meta model which fits all events. Basically, an event has three primary phases of crowd behavior. We have ingress, the people coming in, the queuing barrier system, information management flow, all of the attributes that are assigned towards somebody coming to and getting in a venue. And then the crowd moves into a circulation phase where they move around the venue. So they'd be looking for information signage, we'd look contingency planning. And in all of these instances, we're looking for the early detection of problems. So trying to identify risk in those early phases. And then finally, we look at the crowd getting out. Now, if you imagine you go to an event, your mentality when you're trying to get to the venue of the event is very focused about getting in. So things like signage, information systems, where are my seats? Very important to you. But while you're in the event, a different set of principles come into play. You start to move around the venue of the event. You look to the best vantage point, uh, concession stands, toilets, etc. And then, of course, when the event is finished and you start to leave, you just want to get out there as quickly and efficiently as possible. So understanding that the crowd goes through three different phases. However, you may have an emergency 
during ingress, an emergency mid-event, and an emergency during egress. So these require three very different contingency plans because you're dealing with three different types of crowd behaviour. I'll come to that in a second. We also look at how we might influence crowd behaviour. For instance, there's design information and management. The design of a site will influence the crowd. The information systems will influence the crowd. And your management, your process, procedures, how you deal with identifying early warning indicators and the process of passing that information up through the safety officer. It now starts to look complicated. We've got phases of behaviour, we've got uh, influences on behaviour, and finally we've got normal and emergency behaviour. But we can put that into a very simple template. And that's the beauty about this meta model, is that it fits all events. But the information you put in the boxes allows you to identify what makes that event unique. Now, just to give you some examples, here are a couple from some of my BA Honours students applied to real events where they've put a brief description in the dim ice meta model, and it's not by mistake that it sounds like demise. So the dim ice meta model here is designed to highlight risk and to identify it in red, amber, and green red, yellow, and green in these uh, elements, so that we can identify uh, those areas that might have the highest potential for risk. And you see the three events here, the one on the left, the one in the middle, and the one on the right, identify three different types of events, and we see a very different color matrix. Now, the reason this is so important is because risk analysis is uh, critical to understanding how to define uh, the, uh, sorry, we've got a question there, not to, I hope people in the room can change that. Yes, I am changing that. Uh, I do teach mathematics, and if anybody's interested, please do try and help apply mathematics to uh, event industry. So, let's have a look at it. Risk assessment. And this is where it starts to become very interesting from a mathematical and psychological perspective. We all have different perceptions of risk. And if you look at the likelihood and consequence matrix, which is typically applied to risks, and I'm talking about crowd risks here, you see that it's a multiplication of likelihood times consequence. So unfortunately, that biases our table so that um, nearly 68% of the table is biased towards medium and high risk. Now, psychologically, when somebody's creating a risk assessment, they don't want to define medium or high risk, so they'll underestimate the risks on the site in order to create an appropriate table. The whole reason this is so important goes back to uh, Shannon's information theory and Shannon entropy. Uh, if you look at how we take information, code it in a document, pass that document for someone else to read it and then decode it, the whole process of risk analysis is fatally flawed in the sense that we take a complex situation, reduce it to a nonsensical piece of code, pass that code out to the field where the field have to then decipher it. And invariably, this is done just on the basis of experiential learning. Let's give you an example. <coughs> this is a typical risk assessment for an event. A hazard might be a trip, risk, uh, trip slip or fall. Person at risk at the event, especially the age of those carrying objects, the risk factor, likelihood times consequence, comes to 8. Oh, we need to reduce that. It's too high. So we introduce some measures to control that risk. Pre-event check to remove, remove material, cables, buried information about even ground correct footwear. And we put a person in charge of that risk. In this case, it's Bill Smith. And now we have a revised risk factor because we've taken these measures of now 2, which is low risk. So this is it. Job's done. However, look at the nonsense on that particular page. We've not defined where the trip slips or falls might occur. We've not defined what age it might be or which objects a person carrying could impose a particular risk. We look at uh, pre-event check is badly defined. What's loose material badly defined? How level does uneven ground need to be? Uh, and information about uneven ground and correct footwear. Well, does this mean that elderly people carrying objects need to wear proper shoes and it's Bill Smith's job to do what about it? So if you take just this risk assessment, which is typical for events if they've done a risk assessment, you see that I cannot decode this back to a sensible set of instructions. I think it's even worse. I've seen risk assessments that add in additional columns and colors and just really obscure 
the whole element of it. It's very subjective, and unfortunately, two people can look at the same risk and come up with totally different numbers. What is needed is to identify the location, the duration, and the severity of a risk, and if there are external factors. But this now becomes extremely difficult to describe in words. So one of the tasks we looked at was how do we identify crowd risks on a site so that we can clarify location, duration, and severity. Now, although it's very difficult to do in words, it's actually very easy to do in a color diagram, a, a mathematical model of the site. And here's one. So there's my risk. The uh, site here has got a particular time bar across the top. And if I move the time bar, I can see the location, duration, and severity of the risk is now clearly identified in a very simple diagram. So although we can take a table and define the risk assessment, these numbers lend themselves to both psychologically underestimating the risk. The whole process of writing a risk assessment fails the uh, Shannon entropy theory. And what we do is we teach people how to take these maps and diagrams and identify risks just by using red, amber, green. And I'll show you how easy this is. Here's a site, another one of my BA Honours students, who's basically just identified location duration and severity. So each of these diagrams indicate uh, where we have congestion. And he's decided not to put green on it because everything else is low risks and hence negligible. So only indicated amber and red. You can see this is not somebody who has an arts degree, but the quality of the information right the way through the uh, operating teams, the planning teams, through to the um, people that might be involved in uh, operating a site. Now, however, a pictorial diagram with very few words on it that actually shows them where they need to be, when they need to be there, and what level of risk they might be anticipating. So in order to try and turn this whole process on its head, we draw pictures. Uh, we take a site. We, of course, do various calculations and analysis, um, but the diagrams, both the dim ice meta model in a color form and using these risk maps allow me to, in a few seconds, uh, define the dynamics of risk on a site, which would be practically impossible, impractical in many cases, to document in a form that would be usable. I saw one site with a 20,000 word document, 200 odd pages that defined all the possible risks and contingency measures. In the event of an emergency, that's an intractable document. It's not something they can refer to or even use. We replaced it all with half a dozen diagrams. So really, that's the essence of taking mathematics up to a slightly more complex level, where really it is a matter of life and death. Now, we teach a foundation degree course on this. And in 20 minutes, I can barely get the whole depth of the subject across. There's um, a new master's program, which is uh, internationally We have a slight, we have a slight lag. I can't hear Keith right now. And it talks about it. Keith, there was a lag. Um, I hope you can hear me uh, when... Um now, having looked at uh, major disasters um, around the world, uh, but there are very few mathematical modelers out there. So we take a document, we turn it into a diagram, and we turn it into something useful. Well, I'm just finished, actually. OK. We have experienced some lag spikes, but uh, now it catches up. So when this happens, basically, we are out of sync with keys. Uh, the voice is still coming from keys, but we are not hearing it for a while, and then it all catches up and applauds. So, um, um, so I, um, we 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 were discussing here, Keith, and let this be, I guess, the first question um, is how how do you where do you get these risks from? You say oh, okay. um, people carrying things, and we were 
we were talking about several people here. Well, it's an educator group, so several people here are interested in what you do with children. How? Well, are people able to look at these slides and listen to the recording? Right. <coughs> so, so, so the question is. Um, uh, so the question is, um, uh, well, each what can category of crowd would we have do with uh, children with that? And to it. So um, I, just I assume children could be example. quite good at brainstorming the risks, like what can possibly go wrong. Yes, absolutely. Uh, in fact, we run. not with children but with uh, operators, adults, uh, once they start to think about the process it becomes much easier for them to articulate. However, the industry itself is very low cost, uh, low margin, so the problem that they have is they just cut and paste old documents without thinking. We we still have a bit of a lag. So, Keith, we hear you uh, just with a delay, and I assume you hear us with with a delay. So, um, I'll pose a question that you'll hear it eventually. Um, so, what what you said? This is not taught much. Well, now it is. Now you are teaching a course, and your book came out this year. Uh, can you talk about your book and about your course some more? Uh, that's, I guess, how people can learn about crowd science. How, how people can learn more. Yes, uh, certainly. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, the, the principle is that as a, um, a, a mathematician and a crowd modeler myself, uh, there were very few people that could not only understand but articulate risk. Um, the principle of using traffic lights of green for go, amber for be aware, and red for danger lent itself visually towards not only understanding and mapping risk, but also to help people articulate the scale of uh, key issues across a common language. When we start to use words like likely and less likely, there are interpretations put onto that. But red, amber, green was a far simpler process for people to visualize these things. And the bulk of all of my work has been how do I take something I have a lot of experience with and turn it into useful tools for the operators, emergency services, the site planners and licensing officers that I'm accustomed to teaching and working with. Thank you. Um, so um, I have another question about about learning, teaching and learning. I guess when you you were learning it, you say you, you, your degrees are in psychology and mathematics. But have people taught you specifically crowd science, or 
did you make it? You seem to be one of the creators of crowd science or the, the creator of crowd science. So I assume you weren't taught just that specifically, right? Correct. I think uh, back in the um, uh, early 90s, we called it crowd dynamics because it was focusing on crowd movement. However, it broadens into psychology and behavior and far more than just uh, the numbers of crowd flow. Uh, so we had to broaden the remit, hence the, the, the phrase crowd science as um, focusing on uh, crowd safety, crowd risk analysis. But uh, like all things, you need to have um, a pigeonhole, a box to put your techniques into that people can then identify with and expand upon. I mean, the work on crowd safety still has a long way to go internationally. We have, uh, in the moment, we're in Holland. Uh, next week, I'm in Australia. Um, We've got some work out in uh, Ireland and then across into Texas. So uh, doing work around the world, uh, Saudi Arabia, Singapore, Hong Kong, all of these places have uh, different understandings of risk. Um, trying to unify that into a simple set of criterion that people can not only understand but use and apply and, and, and be able to focus on, on risk as a dynamic rather than a static element. Um, so you you travel a lot and you go to these different places. Um, do you find it harder or easier to work with people um, who have um, well different mathematics education or different relationships with mathematics? So it's not just cultural differences and psychology, but different relationships with mathematics. Can you comment on that? Does it, is it really different by countries? Uh, yes, certainly, uh, Maria. Um, you mentioned mathematics, and as I said, 100% of the audience I deal with uh, feel that mathematics is uh, unfathomable until we show them why it's relevant, and everybody gets it by modeling, by creating meta models, by looking at crowd flow, crowd density, and we can do this in uh, barely a, a few hour sessions. Uh, everybody not only understands the relevance, uh, but also the importance. And to me, there was a significant disconnect between what's taught at schools and what's relevant in the real world. So we're doing nothing more than simple algebra for queuing theory, um, albeit queuing theory can get very complex, but arrivals minus departures over time gives us the number of people who will be in a queue. Uh, when people see the relevance of that, they're, they're basically taking an algebraic formula, uh, a very simple formula, and, and being able to apply it. And the complaint I typically get is, well, if we knew the relevance, we would have paid more attention. Uh, so I think teaching uh, mathematics at this level needs uh, much more emphasis on, on, on the consequences of getting things wrong in order to amplify the need for study, for, for paying attention to something that they would find abstract in any other context. Uh, you say consequences for getting things wrong. Uh, and um, when, when you were writing the description, you, you said you have this phrase that really wakes you up when you read it, get it wrong and somebody can die, or you can be in, in prison for manslaughter. So that's pretty high stakes. But um, um, children, for example, if you work with children or students, they have this high stakes right, this is the, the chart that's very relevant. So students have this test that scares them a lot, the, the high stakes testing, and there is, seems to be more and more of it. But that's not the consequences you mean, right? You're talking about 
some sort of different reality here. Yes, I, hopefully the screen that you're looking at um, will give you an idea of the mass fatalities uh, and in red, if you could see these, those that would have been identified with simple mathematics. So when uh, I do expert witness case, um, we have uh, an argument on one side that says, did you do the numbers? And the argument on the other side is usually, in my experience, that was not necessary. So clearly your experience doesn't count in a situation where you're dealing with fatalities in front of you. So this is what I talk about, is that if, if you could understand the dynamics of risk and paid more attention to the history of crowd disasters and understood how to do the calculations, then you wouldn't face me uh, in court um, as an expert witness looking at your risk assessment and saying it, it, it didn't work, obviously. You didn't do the appropriate job. So um, I'd like to invite you to, to think of young kids. I know you, you teach, well, professional grown-ups and court people, but I'd like to invite you to, to think of of young kids, maybe five-year-olds, <laughs> little ones. Um, so um, what would you do with such a person, with a young child, uh, maybe a relative or a friend who would want to start to explore this? So um, you need to start some way. If you start early, it becomes native to the children. So how would you start with little, little one? How would you design a task for a little child to explore what you do? Oh, I think you can take the concept of, of uh, risk uh, at any level. Um, you know, uh, the proximity to a hot surface, for instance. But uh, if I were teaching children to understand the importance of this, I think I would always make it relevant to uh, why this can be used in the real world. Uh, for instance, I'm looking at my own children's uh, schoolwork, and I, I cannot make a, a logical connection for something that they would then use in the real world. So it's too abstract. Um, and the awareness of, of consequence for the work that I do when I'm teaching adults is that I show them a video clips of people in distress and saying, this is what happens when you get these things wrong. I couldn't do that with children. It's too traumatic. Uh, sometimes uh, an adult mind is receptive to consequences in a very different way to the child's mind. Um, and although I don't teach children, uh, knowing the relevance for some of the uh, the work that my children are doing, um, I just find that that's such a big disconnect that they're they're learning uh, theoretical without thinking about the the real world relevant application. So uh, my son and daughter often come to me and said, "When am I ever going to use this again?" And I explain to them how useful it will be, and I think. This shouldn't be my job to tell them the relevance. This should be within the syllabus. Uh, and unless you make the connection uh, of relevance, um, you're not going to, uh, to, to think about it in the context of uh, something that you are potentially going to use on a regular basis that might have significant consequences in the real world. Uh, people, I, uh, Julia has... Uh to get the good questions, but uh, and we'll get to them in a second. Uh, so, but I want to follow up on relevance because um, education designers, curriculum designers, kind of go back and forth on this one because if you go very specialized and, for example, teach very highly relevant but applied um, cases, uh, then um, kids argue and they well, they're not wrong, they argue that, well, what if I don't become a crowd scientist? Uh, why do I need to learn, yes, this is real, this is relevant to that profession, 
but uh, some people say that general algebra is relevant to everything. But kids don't see it either. What is your take on kind of general mathematics versus applied mathematics for, for children? Uh, well, uh, I'm just typing it here, but if you look at flow rates, for instance, uh, same principles, whether it's a corridor flow of people or, or a fluid flow. So um, I found that when I was uh, doing my degree in physics, um, you know, the fluidic formulas and the principles of people moving down a corridor have different context, although the differential equations are similar in structure. So again, it, it was always to me, when I, I had a better grasp of the mathematics of anything that I was studying, and I did a, um, a degree in uh, pure and applied physics, it was to understand the model that it sat within, the context that it sits around, in order that I could see how to use this, rather than, here's the formula, this is how it's applied, that's what the answer you should be getting. So, looking at anything that might be associated with uh, real-world applications, and uh, again, looking at my children at the moment, my uh, daughter's 15, or my son's 17, so they're going through the educational process, and I find a lot of the work they're doing is, is rote learning. Um, and there is certainly a degree of mastery required for that. But um, again, a, a good hard dose of this is why you should do this, and, and here are some real world applications, uh, seem to be less in the curriculum than the material I teach at, a, at, you know, at the adult side. And they, they, question I keep getting back is, why wasn't I taught the relevance of this when I was at school? You know, I, this would have stuck if, if I'd understood it, that, you know, this is not just playing with numbers, that these can mean the matter of life and death. Now, I know it's difficult, you can't really take that approach with children, because uh, it's a traumatic subject. However, you know, this is not just a, a problem in one country. You see from that list there, it's global. Um, well, I, I think with, with children, you can approach traumatic subjects with uh, defenses that are typical for storytelling as well. You can do pretend play. You can uh, use characters, and you can use maybe less dire situations. So, I mean, a cartoons do all that, but um, yes, so the, the relevance doesn't change if you are working in a fantastic world, N not for most kids. So, uh, Julia has, a, uh, has um, two related questions in chat. Um, what's the best way to develop awareness of putting a number to a consequence for a consequence and uh, evaluating the likelihood? So probabilities, numbers, uh, how can you grow in this, um, not just awareness of what things are, but how heavy they weigh? Well, consequence is uh, very subjective. Uh, you know, one person's pain threshold, for instance, is very different to another. So, what we tend to look at is is try not to put these into um, uh, hard, definable terms, but relative terms. So, we did some work in Saudi, and they were saying, well, to us, a major disaster would be mass fatalities. Uh, in the Western world, a major disaster would be one fatality. So it's a relative scale as to if we take uh, any environment where there are risks, we say the consequence of this risk has a greater financial or medical impact than this risk. And we can put those in order. So if we put the context around um, an order structure so that it becomes relative, but then that then becomes relative to that particular site and that team that are understanding it. The whole problem is, is that it's very subjective. Now, the context, I think, when teaching children is that you need to understand both 
absolute and relative terms um, because one person's financial loss may be absolutely nothing to another person. Um, you know, it depends on where you start from. So, not entirely sure where the the child teaching comes into play. As I said, because I'm a teacher of uh, adults, so I know how to um, put that into proper context with adults. But uh, it would be a fantastic discussion to have about how do we instill this concept of relative and subjective, uh, objective and, and fixed risk analysis for uh, any exercise. Uh, yeah, I think I'm reading there, Julia saying, yes, there's uh, plenty of books where uh, a good fun exercise could be developed. And I think the whole concept of risk analysis, particularly when you're dealing with crowds, is very poorly documented, very poorly understood. <coughs> Yes, Mary, that's a very good uh, set of statements there. Um, well, uh, I I think some of this, <coughs> some of this, um, some of this experiences probably apply not only to crowds but to some household events or to what you can observe in nature. Um, we once did an a math circle with five-year-old kids. Uh, simply, they were sitting. They they wouldn't come inside when I was waiting for them for the math circle. And I went out and found a lot of them in the big pile of leaves. It was a beautiful fall day, probably yeah. October, and they were sitting in the leaves and playing. And so I just threw away all my plants and said, "Well, let's find out how many of those wonderful leaves there are." And we spent the whole hour estimating how many leaves uh, my orc dropped into that pile. And um, well, that's a very good point because quite a lot of the problems are people failing to make reasonable estimates of the number of people you can get into a space, uh, the rate at which a space will fill. So when you talk about estimating leaves, this whole principle of, of estimation, I think um, I've noticed certainly over the last 20 years that uh, I learned using a slide rule uh, the feeling of numbers and certainly of um, quantities. But nowadays, because we uh, use computers, we've switched off that ability to make reasonable estimates. Um, and I find that people will reach for a computer to try and get 10 decimal point accuracy when uh, really within an order of 10 would be fine or within order of 100 would be fine or even 1,000 depending on your space and size. Uh, but knowing where things reach capacity uh, as approximations, I think it's a very important point to instill. So I think your example there... Um, Maria, of, of estimating the number of leaves is, is an excellent uh, foundation for estimating crowd risks and estimating the numbers of people. Just look at that page in front of you and see how many are because there are too many people and not enough space. So estimating its capacity is an absolute prerequisite here. Um, so... Yep, Julia. Uh, computer games could help with estimation. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, oh, I was talking with my microphone off. Okay, that's a danger. That's not a deathly danger, but still, what is the probability of me clicking twice instead of once? Okay, <laughs> so, um, so it's about two to one, maybe, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's random. <laughs> so, Keith, I want to ask you for more mathematical ideas. So it seems like estimation and approximation and 
it, it gets complex when you estimate orders of magnitude or functions that approximate something. So uh, these are kind of foundational skills here. And yes, you can teach little kids that with various techniques. What are some other big foundational skills you would name that are part of your trade? So estimation, approximation, what else? Uh, fill rates. So um, we have many situations where there are a number of entry points, a number of uh, exit points. And um, I started to apply differential calculus to this, and very quickly um, it was unteachable. However, uh, if you think about it um, in terms of number in and number out as step functions, so a, what we call a bucket brigade delay, like a spreadsheet when you're carrying the numbers from cell to cell, then that gives a better visualization of rates of fill. If you put it in terms of calculus, I, I would lose 100% of my audience. So uh, trying to simplify um, a complex uh, situation where we have multiple entry points and multiple exit points, but I still need to maintain a less than the maximum density, uh, number of people in the area, uh, there are some very, very simple tools that allow you to do that. Uh, for example, I've had people trying to sell computer counting technology, which is only at best 80% accurate. And yet I can achieve exactly the same using, say, say I have an event, I've, I've got multiple entry points, multiple exit points, but I can't have more than 10,000 people on the site. What is the simplest way of achieving that? Uh, we can do it without counting by starting off with 10,000 plastic wristbands. Uh, as people come in, we give them a band. When they go out, we take it off them. So long as I've got bands, I'm never over capacity. I don't need calculus. I need a practical tool that sits in the real world that would allow me to do the counting for myself. Those kind of techniques, we find there are lots of those techniques in the industry, but they're not well documented, they're not um, uh, known about, and, and we see the same mistakes getting made over and over again for those kind of situations. So, again, that would lend itself more to a practical teaching uh, principle, maybe at a younger age, but as I said, really my, my focus is very much more on uh, an adult audience. So it's, I'm possibly not the right person to be asking those type of questions. So Keith, um, let me see if I if I heard you right. So you say that calculus, uh, when you go into calculus, let alone differential equations, uh, you lose people. But the same ideas can be expressed, well, instead of differentials, you can deal with differences. And then everything yes. becomes approximate. So the switch to differences is a powerful um, getaway <laughs> drug or ramp to calculus. So um, I've actually applied it to little kids um, in uh, applications like um, Minecraft or just working with Lego blocks. So uh, Lego blocks, just little bricks, right? They are bricks and they are discrete. So kids can build with them. And you can explore all calculus ideas in this discrete world of differences uh, just very directly, like you said, with the bucket brigades and uh, step functions. Yes. Well, I think there are many such examples. And I think if I were to sit down and spend a few days thinking about what would be the best way to instill the principles that are lacking in the industry uh, from the adult perspective, and, and how would I put that back into the syllabus? So I could probably come up with a dozen different um, fundamental techniques, uh, mostly on uh, crowd flow and um, and on, on risk uh, approximations, but also on um, behavior as to why people uh, do what they do. I think there's a, a definite overlap in these two areas, uh, which is why, as I said, we, we define that as a crowd science rather than try to say maths of science and maths of psychology and 
maths associated with crowds. It's, um, it requires an understanding of how people's behavior will change when you expose them to risk. So there's uh, quite a, an interesting and very rich uh, field involved here. And the world's crying out for mathematicians to assist the adult population with specific bits of mathematics that help them in the job. And uh, it's something that I think comes very easily from the outside. I mean, I got involved in this when I got stuck in a queue. I was trying to work out what was happening. Uh, then realized that the formula that people had told me to apply for Crowdflow was completely wrong and needed throwing out and, and rethinking. That's been, you know, 25 years worth of work started from that particular point. Crowds don't flow like fluids. There are some approximations you can use, but it's not a, um, a hard and fast uh, application for that. What's an intriguing idea you just expressed, uh, sitting down and uh, listing the foundational uh, ideas and ways that are accessible to very general audience, even young kids, uh, you know, mass anxious people, non-scientists. That could be a, uh, an interesting, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know what object it would be, a poster or a book or some, some sort of um, list of things people could do with their kids so that the general uh, literacy in the crowd science increases. That would be interesting to accomplish. Um, so um, there are several, uh, Jen listed several great ideas on um, uh, listing things. And um, Mary made an interesting point earlier about context relevant to different people. Mm, so all the things that come back to relevancy Oh, a coloring book, crowd management coloring book. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> uh, choose your own adventure. Um, maybe we need to keep it rated child safe. So maybe the crowds don't, maybe not quite based it on this table. Mm -hmm. Well, if I could say, Maria, we actually have uh, two exercises that I, I run with the class is that we have little cardboard cutout men and they put them and arrange them on uh, one square meter and then we mark out a one square meter on the ground and we get them to stand and we increase to two, three, four, five, six. But at each phase we ask them what it feels like. So they learn the difference here between density and the perception of, of comfort and risk. Uh, so just illustrating this, I have, I have one delegate that wants to do a fuzzy felt um, crowd density book, so um, but a crowd management coloring book could be useful as well. I think it's, uh, it, there's definitely um, a lot of very, very simple exercises that I run through that, that I've used and, and then thrown away or modified over the years. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, quite a lot of this uh, has come from just teaching. Uh, I think you only learn a subject really well when you're trying to teach people about it. So uh, I, I run about uh, 20 of these courses a year worldwide and it's always fascinating to see how simple things can make such a huge difference. Um, this, this, is, uh, this is great. Um, yeah. Uh, if if you are interested in this project uh, in, in, in or your students are that that can be an interesting area to pursue so yeah. we we uh, uh let's let's talk about it so um i'd like to ask another question that i'm asking everyone who comes to this event so kids now is now is your turn <laughs> and uh, the question is um how can people help you in your course? And by people, I mean interested people like those in the audience now, the larger network, so mathematics, mathematician people, people, mathematicians, mathematics educators, parents, children, teens. How can we all uh, help you in what you do? 
Well, uh, there are a lot of people that uh, play with um, computer simulations, and uh, they become godlike. Uh, They, they they play with the computer dots on the screen without any experience of crowds. Um, and the danger is that there is a lot of very poor simulations of crowds out there. So the understanding of crowd risk is also uh, very, very poor. Uh, what is needed is some um, solid validation, some real world uh, observations, uh, but basically, to just have anybody with mathematical skills and ability to assist in documenting some of the simple maths that's involved in crowd risk in, and in crowd flow, it would help enormously just to raise awareness. The problem, as you see on that screen in front of you, is that people don't know what they're doing. Uh, and the more we spread the word, the, the more that they'll become aware that there are courses out there, there are tools they can use, and there are some excellent uh, mathematically minded individuals that can greatly assist uh, this type of risk to reduce it. But uh, generally, mathematicians don't go into events management. So you have a disconnect between... Is there a Hang on, I'm reading some questions here. Uh, citizen science computer simulation, the danger is you need to know enough about crowds. Patterns and emergence, again, you need to know enough about crowds. Uh, but documenting existing practices, that's one of the key issues. Nobody records the near misses. So the industry has no mechanism of feeding back uh, and doing quality assurance, quality improvement. Because the, although these are incidents that have resulted in mass fatalities, nobody wants to admit they had a close call. Whenever I run a workshop, I ask that question, how many people here have had a close call? And they'll all admit to it, but won't document it. So clearly there's a huge gap in understanding risk and, and keeping these uh, spaces safer. And you just need to look at that list to realize what a serious issue it is. There are tens of thousands of events running every year that uh, don't necessarily have uh, accidents or incidents. But there are many, many more close calls that uh, could be significantly improved with just some basic uh, mathematical understanding and some basic education within the system. I think to make a real improvement, we need uh, quality assurance standards, standards of uh, competence. Uh, if you deal with any industry that has safety critical uh, criteria, then you would find that the quality assurance and, and uh, critiques are very rigorous. But in the events industry, they are non-existent. Wow, a lot to think about on all levels, from little kids to professionals. So uh, it's it's interesting. I want to say how you find and identify these areas of need and develop tools for them that can help so many people. And uh, one thing that I think children need in particular are uh, just to see people doing that, to see the role models of people going above and beyond their training between different areas of expertise like mathematics, psychology, and sociology, and what else, whatever it takes to solve the problem. So this is something we need the drive. We need to somehow uh, spread out and distribute among our children so they can be uh, more like uh, Dr. Keith still. Okay, so um, I we are at the end of the time and I don't want to keep you beyond um, the, the time we said, but this, this is such an interesting um, development uh, for me because 
because of their connections to everything everybody does, uh, to those complexities that applies to, to everyday life. We, we are all in crowds uh, at some points of our lives. And uh, um, we, we, we all probably have experienced those near misses you are talking about at some point. Um, so um, for my part, I almost died once in a crowd, and uh, I'm still scared to even think back about it. Um, to, to it. Uh, but um, I, I'm, I, I'm glad we could talk today. We had a bit of uh, a disturbance in computing at the beginning, but now it all worked out. This event will be recorded. And I want to thank everyone for coming, Keith, and I'd like to thank you very much for coming to Mass Future and talking about these issues. Well, thank you very much. I think there's a good point that's put on there. Um, nobody celebrates uh, um, you doing your job. I mean, I, I've been safety advisor and tactical advisor on a number of events. At the end of the, you know, you've done your job. But if something goes wrong, you'd be the one that would be up in court about it. So there's no real upside. But I, I don't do it for that. I do it because it could be my children one day. And, you know, what, what better uh, task, uh, what better role to do in life than to improve the safety? Um, I do this around the world. I, uh, and I thoroughly enjoy my job. And thank you very much for giving the opportunity to say a bit more about it. But... Um, it's been a fascinating lifelong study, and I, I hope more people become aware of um, picking up uh, the mantle and, and starting to see how, how much more we could be doing to assist uh, these major events in understanding risk and, and, and uh, keeping crowds safe. Thank you very much for your time. Bye. Thank you. I'm going to stop the recording. Take care. Thank you so much for coming, for doing it, for... Um everything.